This is the eLearning Podcast, episode number 62. I believe that companies, educators, organizations out there who are focused on creating the strongest or most effective relationship between a student and instructor are truly going to be the companies who end up making the biggest impact in education. Welcome to the eLearning Podcast. My name's Laddick, and I'm your host from LMSPulse.com. My guest for today is John Fiala, the founder and CEO of Pearl, a full-service platform for tutoring companies and institutions. In this instructional conversation, John and I talk about the evolution from John's first tutoring venture called Trilogy Mentors to the full-service platform of Pearl and how this pivot was driven by the need to simplify all of the different technology pieces used in a typical tutoring experience. We also talk about the realization of just how fragmented the tutoring sector is through the experience of building the Pearl platform for themselves, and then having others ask to license it from them. We also talk about John's vision for Pearl to become more than a tutoring technology platform, and how there is incredible opportunity to aggregate resources and create trusted standards across the sector. We also talk about two key challenges faced by tutoring companies today, which include differentiation and accessing the vast amount of funds available from governments and other outlets. We also talk about why culturally relevant instruction is important for making a deeper impact with students and the pros and cons between local versus global tutoring companies. We also talk about pricing variability in tutoring and all of the factors that drive these variations. And then finally, we talk about the parenting approach to tutoring and whether or not we're asking too much or too little of our kids. But before we get started, a quick word from our sponsors. The eLearning Podcast is sponsored by the eLearning Success Summit. Learn from more than 40 experts how to teach, work, and learn online without being overwhelmed. Get your free ticket to the summit at eLearningSuccessSummit.com and LMSPulse.com your best source for news, information, and resources for e-learning professionals for more than 10 years. Get our free roundup of the week's top news at lmspulse.com. Hello, John. Welcome to e-learning podcast. How are you today? Doing well, Stephen. Thanks for having me. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you. John, as everybody knows, I'm sitting here in Mexico City. Uh, Where do we find you sitting today? Uh, Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia. I love it. The South. Um, So. Uh, you know, I've already teed you up in the introduction to the podcast here. You're the CEO and founder of a, of a company that's now called Pearl, but give me the 15, 20 seconds in your own words. What does Pearl do and, and why are we sitting here today? Yeah. So at Pearl, we provide an all-in-one platform to tutoring companies and institutions looking to launch large scale blended tutoring programs. Super cool. And I'm very excited to talk about why blended why that's important because, you know, everybody's online everywhere right now. Yeah. Final question before we dive in. Uh, I've been using the, the podcast as a time capsule over the past year or so here on the COVID situation. What is, what's the COVID situation like in Richmond these days? Yeah. So, you know, the COVID situation in Richmond uh, is getting a slightly worse by the day as it is a lot around a lot of the country with Delta. But uh, the city of Richmond itself was actually a pretty amazing city to be in during this past uh, 16 months because the city itself is very young, very spread out. I pay around $2,000 living in a house with a front yard and backyard with another roommate. So um, as you can imagine, you know, definitely costs uh cost willing, but uh, yeah, it's been uh, pretty interesting to be in the city, especially in one that's a little more spread out. You know, the day today hasn't necessarily changed too much recently for us. We work out of uh, the 1717 Innovation Center, which is run by Startup Virginia and is actually an old tobacco warehouse that Capital One bought and turned it into a incubator for Mm. a high growth startup space in the city. So they've done an outstanding job uh, making it very clean, very sanitary. And um, Startup Virginia, the group who operates it, has continued to do great programming virtually. So it hasn't been too bad. We're really excited for things to get fully opened again and um, have just been fortunate enough to be in a position where we've been able to help thousands of educators with this uh, tumultuous past 16 months. Super cool. Yeah. Now this, you, you definitely guessed right on the platform to have for, you know, the last 16 months here, but um, tell me where it started. Let's, let's, let's start there. I mean, Pearl is the name today, but 
this is a this is an evolution. Um, you used to be called Trilogy Mentors. I'm yeah. I just need to know the backstory. Like, wh- why Trilogy? What what happened there? Yeah. So uh, it's actually been five years in the making. This rebrand. Um, Trilogy Mentors started my senior year at University of Richmond, where I was an entrepreneurship major, and we had to start a company that was really organic to our own experience. So growing up was a great lacrosse player, loved playing the ukulele, but wasn't necessarily the greatest math student. So um, I had tutors from a very early age and never really connected with them until there is one that I viewed more as a mentor or someone who I really had a relationship with, not just a tutoring experience with. His name was Josh. He tutored me in math, but then also helped me in sports and kind of the rest of my life as well. So when I was at University of Richmond, the original concept of Trilogy Mentors was to provide mentorship in academics, athletics, and the arts. We did that for the first year after graduating from college, focused on academics, did over a thousand hours of instruction. But more importantly, my professor made me do 100 hours of consumer interviews. Mm -hmm. And it was in those interviews and talking to parents, students, and our mentors that we learned about this growing trend in online education. Students, all of their homework was being assigned digitally, and they're busier now than they ever were before. So being able to just open a laptop and meet with a tutor as opposed to having to travel somewhere was really interesting and engaging for them. On the parental side of things, parents loved our service, but they wanted more transparency into the actual tutoring lessons and also didn't love driving their students around town. So in moving online that had customized reports as well as video recordings was something very that resonated with them well. And then at the end of the day, we were in the business of relationships. And the number one reason we couldn't create a relationship was always location. So we realized that by going online, we could actually develop relationships that just weren't possible in the past. So we wanted to move online as a tutoring company. I was a non-technical founder, though. So we were looking to license out a platform, and we just couldn't find the right one. So we led to us cobbling together Mm. six or seven different tools to facilitate what should have really been an all-in-one experience. And it led to a very fragmented experience for the families and students. So we realized- we get, So get, wait, I'm, I'm gonna put a, put a pin right there though, cause I wanna know what, what were the pieces that, were, that you had to cobble together? Is it like, here's our community space, here's our engagement space, here's the actual LMS space. Like, like what were the pieces that you had to put together? Yeah, great question. And uh, it ranged from us using Gmail for initial communication to Calendly for scheduling sessions to PayPal for collecting money for a combination of Google Sheets and Zapier to see what actual sessions were being used to Dropbox for file storage to Skype for the video uh, processing itself and then Scribbler an additional whiteboard for the actual instruction during the session. So as you can imagine, administratively managing those seven or eight components was logistically heavy. And then for a parent having to figure out, okay, is this coming through PayPal or Gmail Mm -hmm. or this is in Dropbox now? It just wasn't a great experience for them either. Yeah, no, I, I, as a parent of three myself, I, you know, we tear our hair out right, you know, regularly with every, you know, every teacher kind of comes with their, is it, I, is it IXL? Is it, you know, Quora, is it this, that, you know, what are, what are we looking at? Lots of different apps, especially over the last year. So as you've made the pivot from, you know, Trilogy Mentors to Pearl, what is the single biggest evolution piece for you? Like what, you know, what's the, okay, we, we, we made this huge decision and this rebrand and everything in order to do X. What, what is that? Yeah, well, you know, when we decided to build our own platform when we were still Trilogy Mentors, we actually built our own platform for ourselves. So we built this all-in-one tool, scaled to over 6,000 hours annually with that tool, but it was in that scale where we started being approached by other tutoring companies saying, hey, we need to go online. We can't find a platform. We're going to have to build one. Can we look at your platform? So it was at that point where we invited them into our office to get a demo of the system. By the end of it, they both asked to license and white label the platform as opposed to building it themselves. And then it was at that moment where we realized the tutoring industry was one of the most fragmented industries in the world, let alone in education, where the 10 largest tutoring companies only controlled 8% of the Mm. total U.S. tutoring market. So what we saw back in 2017 was this wave of digitization taking place. You know, all these mom and pops that control this industry were moving online, but they really had no great tool to do it. Very much like, you know, the pickaxe salesman 
We saw everyone going west to find gold, all these tutoring companies going online, but they didn't have the right tools to look for it. So when we started licensing the platform in 2019, we knew we were going to have to license the software and kind of be that technical backbone. But the more interesting thing in our pivot and development as a company was the uh, knowledge that our partners were looking for from us in their transition online. Because they viewed us as a company who did it in a very successful way. So they were as interested in picking our brain on what's the best type of scheduling rules to put in when you're doing a blended tutoring company, as opposed to just asking for us to give them the tool to do the scheduling. So we're positioned in a pretty fortunate spot where we don't just have the tools um, our partners need, but we actually have the experience and the expertise to help them get there and be successful in their business goals as well. So you're, yeah, so like my brain has to, has to also pivot in that you're not student facing, you're not, you know, B2C facing, you're B2B facing. And what's, what's the, you know, I know that you've, you've been fortunate enough, you know, you're, you're in an investment, you know, uh, portion of your company right now, or you're, you're in a, in, in a round of investment. Uh, is that the strategy moving forward? Or are you just building out the platform, making it more robust, providing this academy of services, et cetera, or is there another strategy in sort of in starting, you know, acquiring and bringing in other companies and whatnot, or what, what's the vision there? Yeah. So we believe there to be a huge white space in the market when it comes to real thought leadership around tutoring technology. You have some great tutoring players out in the space who have been around for a long time and some big players like a varsity tutors or VIP kid, where there's some really interesting dynamics taking place abroad right now in the tutoring space. But then you also have some mom and pop tutoring companies who have been working on the same corner for the last two or three decades. So what we believe is that the tutoring industry itself almost needs guidance or needs like a Sherpa, for lack of a better term, in helping them through this digital transformation into this new tutoring world that's being developed post COVID. Um, uh, So the vision for Pearl as a business wants to be a one-stop shop, not just for tutoring companies, but also for anyone looking to do business with tutoring companies because of how fragmented the space is. Mm. So this is what I see being able to happen in like five to 10 years from now. Tutoring company comes to our website, signs up for the platform, gets a Pearl accreditation saying they passed background checks as well as some certain criteria that they can actually teach what they say. Because whenever an industry is this fragmented, bad actors naturally find their way into it. They'd then be able to go to the Pearl Marketplace, buy whatever assessments or online games or content that they can actually leverage to run their business, be able to integrate it into their system, and then ideally be put into the Pearl lead generation funnel, where we're able to help families and students and even organizations find the best tutoring companies around the country to work with, all through a proprietary matching algorithm that we've started to take the initial steps on. However, before we can get to that large vision, step number one in a vertical SaaS playbook, quote unquote, which is the type of business we're building today, is around building a meaningful tool that allows you to aggregate the supply in the industry. So today, our focus is on hitting a critical mass of tutoring companies leveraging our platform, because once we can do that, we're confident we'll be able to help connect families after school programs or nonprofits to the tutoring company's best position to serve them. Juxtapose this for me against something like Khan Academy. Like what, what's, you know, as you know, a brand, everybody knows, at least every parent knows, right? At, at this stage, give me, give me that story. Like what's the difference here? And how does this, you know, let me, I'll just put that on your desk. What's the difference? Yeah. So Khan Academy is an amazing resource for students of all ages, specifically when they're really trying to improve in math. So the way we kind of differ to Khan Academy is Khan Academy is very focused on the content side of the actual instruction. It's like, what are the students going to be learning from and how are they going to be learning from it? We aren't in the content game. We want to leverage folks like Khan Academy so that their content can come into our ecosystem in a very meaningful way for any tutoring companies who want to leverage Khan Academy. However, we also have groups on our platform teaching things ranging from like chess to Mandarin. So we're not building a platform that's specifically meant just to teach math instruction or just to teach algebra or one specific content in a way. What we're building is a very flexible ecosystem that allows educators to loop in whatever tools they want to use that they believe produces the best student outcomes. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, that's why we're all in this game. 
So however we can empower educators with the right tools, ecosystems, or content like Khan Academy that can be integrated in a very meaningful way to improve student outcomes, those are the decisions we try to make. Mm. I want to talk about tutoring itself for a bit because you've been in the business for a while. You're now purporting to bring in, you know, what you say, you know, these fragmented mom pop shops, some of them probably bigger, um, et cetera. What, you know, give me like, what are the three biggest challenges tutoring companies face? I mean, but, but beyond client acquisition, right? Obviously you've always got to find students to come into the pipeline and be a part of like, but like, let's just say that you've got a thriving business that is perpetual, right? Like that you're, you're self-sustaining. What are the big issues today in tutoring? Like what's, what's the big deal? Yeah. So I'd say one differentiation when there's so many different tutoring companies in the space, you really need to be able to make yourself stick out from the crowd. And um, I'd say that's an area where in the past year, We've really seen a renaissance in new tutoring companies being started because of how many teachers have actually been leaving the classroom due to the frustrations caused with COVID. Mm. So in being able to differentiate your actual tutoring business itself by being an athlete focused tutoring company who doesn't just help you with math, but connects you to a student athlete who also understands the academic rigors of playing at a division one school. Mm. Those are the companies we're starting to see pop up, which address a niche but a niche that is still valuable enough to get an actual business generated from it and be able to do something meaningful there. So I'd say the first side is around differentiation. Um, I think one of the very interesting hurdles that we're seeing addressed today, specifically in the tutoring industry, is around RFPs that districts are starting to put out. Mm -hmm. So recently, or in the past year, the American Rescue Plan got put into effect over a trillion dollars with over 120 specifically focused on education. Um, Inside of that, around 20% of the funds are being required to be used for services that mitigate learning loss. In around November of 2020, McKinsey, as well as a few other organizations did reports that identified high dosage tutoring as being one of the most effective ways for schools to mitigate learning loss that students experienced over this past year of COVID instruction. So what we see now are states, districts, um, even some like charter schools putting together these RFPs that are allowing local tutoring businesses to bid and try to gain access to some of this 20 something billion dollars that's yeah. been remarked for learning loss over the next three years. So we've been able to support a few uh, private tutoring companies in their proposal or acquisition of these RFPs, but we also have one client where we're actually supporting them from a state level helping them leverage over 6,000 education majors at one of the teaching colleges in the state to create an army of tutors to provide tutoring to every uh, K-8 student that requires it for early literacy challenges throughout the state. So that's one that we're really excited to be able to help. We're also seeing a few other of these statewide tutoring cores get put into place that we believe are an amazing resource because one, they're not just helping the student, but two, a lot of them are leveraging education majors at schools within these states. So they're actually getting these education majors, one, paid more than they would be getting paid on campus, but two, it's giving them very relevant work experience Mm -hmm. for what we all know is going to be a big part of the future of education, which is this online instruction, specifically what we're seeing is more blended, where one day the student's going to be in person, the next day they're going to be meeting with an instructor online, but also focused on building that relationship. Two-part question for you. Thank you for that. Those are two great challenges, differentiation and then, um, you know, accessing those funds and sort of, you know, responding to this need, I guess, is I I want to put that in a a better way. Mm -hmm. So where that triggered me for me, my, my next question is, how local does tutoring have to be? So one of the great promises, and we've seen this now through, uh, you know, I don't want to go down this path quite yet, but China just announced that we're recording this, you know, on September 7th, you know, in 2021, China announced, you know, a week ago that they are shutting down all tutoring, you know, uh, essentially in the country, especially English tutoring, right? And this has been a shockwave that has gone through the industry because this is literally thousands of people who've been providing, you know, tutoring uh, to to Chinese people from the United States, especially in, in the United Kingdom and whatnot. 
my point though is, is that if we're thinking about a hybrid future where one day you're online or a week you're online, this happened to my child already this year, you know, they, they had to come out of school for a week because of, uh, of a COVID, you know, incident. And then they, now they've gone back. How do we, you know, so how local does tutoring have to be in order to make this happen? And then also does that then create a barrier to, you know, the promise of the interweb where, Hey, yeah. I'm going to set up my, my I'm going to set my tutoring shop and I don't have to stay here in Poughkeepsie. I can also be tutoring in Buenos Aires and, you know, Beijing and, you know, wherever else I want to be. Let me, let me put that universe of a question on the table for you. And what, what do you think? Yeah. So it's interesting in breaking down the like pros and cons of local tutoring resources versus um, not necessarily foreign, but non-local tutoring resources. Sure. And, you know, a perfect example is when it comes to local tutoring, a lot of times that tutor has had other students who have also been in that teacher's class. Mm. So when it comes to that local tutoring, there's a certain level of relationship that's nearly impossible to recreate because I've been tutoring seventh grade algebra students who have all been going to Miss Nancy's class for the last decade. So I can call Miss Nancy and be like, hey, where's Joey really struggling? Give me more details so that I can truly support him. So that's a level of support and continuity or synergy that you get on the hyper local level, which you aren't really always able to get when it's more broadened or spread out. So I think that's something to acknowledge that does bring value to pure local support. One of the big things though, and one of the huge cons of only working locally is the limit it puts around your relationship capability. Because a lot of tutoring companies, and I'm one to believe this, the relationship is the number one indicator of success between a student and instructor, whether that's a kindergartner learning math or an executive getting tutored in how to be a better CEO. If, we're fo if you're forced to only work within your given geographic area, that drastically limits the person who you're able to get connected with and start to build a relationship with. So one of the areas where we're seeing a lot of groups go to actual virtual instruction instead, because it's way more accessible and easy to leverage, is when it comes to culturally relevant instruction, where you're able to actually bring in instructors who don't live down the street from you, but grew up in the same hometown where hyper successful made it to an Ivy League and can now tutor students from their hometown virtually mm -hmm. and then still see them whenever they come back in person. So I think the cultural relevance, which is also a big focus in a lot of like urban and inner city education today, is something that needs to be leveraged in a virtual manner because I believe a culturally relevant instructor who is virtual versus a non-relevant instructor who's in person, I believe that relevant virtual instructor is going to be able to make a stronger impact. Mm. What about tie to curriculum? So if, if I'm a global provider, if I'm, or even just a national provider of tutoring services, uh, I have clients in New York and Texas and Florida and Washington, um, or, you know, I'm truly a global provider and some of my tutors are actually in Europe or maybe they're in Latin America or, or a different part of the world. And then I need to be able to say, hey, look, my student comes in from this district uh, in, you know, northern Colorado, and I have to be able to connect them back to that. Is the base of knowledge or are the skill sets the tutors are putting out there, are they broad enough that that, you know, that that it, that 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 specific curriculum doesn't matter and tying that back? Or is that, a, I'm, maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe this is a part of your business strategy. Being able to connect that and, and check those boxes, is that a key piece of the future? So that's a great question. And that that's a question that really goes to show what's the experience the tutor and company actually has, because it comes down to the pacing calendars where in the given districts or areas where the students are working. That is definitely a positive or a pro when it comes to working with that local agency, because <laughs> they've had experience with the student who's went through seventh grade because they've worked with 20 of them in the past year, all going through in RICO middle school. So that's a big benefit for that local provider. You know, when we ran a blended company and had some folks learning in person, some folks learning completely online, we actually took it on ourselves to empower our instructors with that information. So whenever a student came on, we would share the pacing calendar mm. for the given district or given private school with that instructor, as well as the uh, 
curriculum and um, any syllabus that the student was provided so that the instructor knew what was being taught. But more importantly, we knew whether or not the instructor could actually teach it. Mm. So that's an area where some of these smaller tutoring companies that do more white glove matching tend to perform a little bit better because they're able to have that person step in and say, you know what, this curriculum includes X, Y, Z, which Tim is good at, but Jim isn't, so let's give it to Tim. Um, you lose some of that detail and some of that nuance when you go to some of these larger companies that are in the more marketplace model. So that is a very strong positive for the local groups, but by no means is it something that a larger purely virtual tutoring company wouldn't be able to overcome. That earnest then falls on the tutoring company to make sure their instructors are empowered and able to help the students because providing high dosage tutoring versus homework help are two very different things. Homework help is like a student having a question with something saying, hey, tutor, please give me the answer to this. We've seen there to be a ton of cheating in that industry where students will give tutors tips and five star ratings. If they just give them the answer, don't actually teach them. That tends to get that tutor to the top of the tutoring list because they got a tip and a five star, which the algorithm believes to mean a great instructor. <clears throat> So we've seen more of the relationship-based instruction where the instructor knows the pacing calendar and the curriculum for them to then be able to bring their own content to the session, as opposed to just relying on the student asking for homework help. Mm. One more question in this line, in this vein, in those RFPs that you've seen from school districts and whatnot, are there, are there pieces of this uh, that we're talking about right now that are, that are a part of that where it's like, uh, you know, hey, we're the district of Aurora and you know, a part of this tutoring is that you're, you know, we're going to share the curriculum and the tutoring company is going to be required to ensure that whenever we send you a student, they're able to kind of seamlessly get back into that. Is that a, is that a thought? Yes. So integrations with SISs is, is a big request from a lot of these RFPs um, because they want to make sure there's connectivity between what the students being taught in the class and what the students being taught outside of the class. Because mm -hmm. if there's a disconnect there, then that's where the student can be told one thing here, another thing there, and just be more confused than anything else. So integrating with SIS systems is something we've seen um, more so when tutoring companies work with districts, there's a lot of knowledge share around what is the curriculum, any IEPs, um, any specific, excuse me, any specific data related to like that student and that student's learning preference is something that a lot of groups are looking for. Um, but it ends up being that relationship between the district and the tutoring company. And what we will say is we see the majority of RFPs today being written for in-person with the mm. requirement of blended um, capability. We haven't seen as many asking for pure online because there is a big desire within the tutoring industry to be back in person. Um, and an example I'll give is <clears throat> we actually took a strategic investment from the Tuscany Strategy Group, okay. which is a consultancy based up in Baltimore, Two uh, principals of it, David Long was an SVP at Laureate Education, ran one of the nation's largest tutoring programs under No Child Left Behind. David Graves was uh, the founding president of eSylvan, which was Sylvan's online tutoring division. I was concerned about the way COVID was gonna affect the tutoring industry, the needs of a platform it was gonna affect in the space, and then also the pendulum, how far back was it gonna swing to in-person instruction? What we learned is that after surveying around 3,000 tutoring companies, around 30 to 40% of the tutoring industry was online in some form or fashion before COVID happened. Mm -hmm. during, the, during COVID and during the lockdowns, the vast majority moved online. What we learned is that over 86% of the market plans to maintain some form of online instruction when the economy is fully open. The most interesting detail, though, is the majority of that 86% actually wants to use it as a secondary form of delivery or a form of business continuity as, a for, as opposed to a primary form of delivery. So a lot of the industry now understands the value in online, but has a deep desire to go back to in-person, which is why we believe the future of the space to be one where on Monday or on Tuesday, you're meeting in person with your instructor, able to sit down next to them and also have that water cooler talk for lack of a better term. But then on Thursday or Friday, or maybe Saturday, if you have to travel to a different state for a sporting game, you're able to do that uh, second session or third session virtually. Mm. That is really interesting. I, I, I'm 
I'm intrigued that the desire to be in person is so profound. Um, I would think that from a business perspective, the scalability of an online delivery would be um, per, would be preferable. That's a really interesting piece. Yeah, so um, it definitely. Ahead. But one uh, tidbit I'd add there is that when students were forced to go online, the learning loss that mounted up was pretty significant. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, tutoring companies are in it for the students. Sure. So their business can only be as successful as they make their students. A lot of companies struggled this past year and a half with the wrong tools trying to make their students successful. So that's, in my opinion, one of the big reasons why so many people want to go back to in person because they had done it for so long. They know how to control that environment and make a student successful. What we've seen are the companies who learned how to adopt not just any tool, but the right tool start to scale significantly up online in a virtual manner, which releases a lot of those business bottlenecks you're, uh, you're referring to. So what are the components of the right tool? Is it, I'm not going to even put, I'm not going to lead the, lead the horse, you know, yeah. I'm not, not going to lead the witness. What are, what are the, what are the key, key components of the right tool? Yeah. So from my perspective, the number one thing is uh, user engagement. So there's the saying, you know, it takes a village to raise a kid. Um, it really takes a village for a child to achieve their academic potential. The teacher can't just be doing their job. The parent also needs to be engaged, making sure the students get into where they need to be when they need to be and that um, anything that needs to be done after the session is actually getting done. The tutor needs to be connected. There needs to be continuity between what the teacher is saying and what the tutor is saying. The student needs to have a very easy way for them to play their part in the relationship as well, which a big part of that is like attendance, like how can we actually help drive attendance of the student? So the first thing, and then the platform needs to be able to give meaningful insights and data to the administrators because all of these RFPs are asking for significant reporting on efficacy, attendance, and what the instructors are actually doing mm -hmm. when these organizations get the money. So number one, the platform needs to understand that what a parent needs to do for the student to be successful versus what the student needs to do versus what the tutor needs to do versus what the admin needs to do are four very different jobs. And the platform needs to make that job as easy as possible for each one of those users. So I'd say fundamentally making it easy for every stakeholder to play their part in the student's academic journey is number one. Number two then gets into the actual intricacy of the system. Like is your scheduling tool connected to your billing tool so that when a student learns a session from them is automatically deducted and notifications are sent out when users run low, as opposed to use a tutoring company you need to make sure you have one administrator whose sole job is reconciling what sessions were bought, what type of session were they, who actually taught the lesson, how many sessions are left. Mm. In your experience, how much time does a tutor spend delivering instruction versus administering either their personal practice or their business? And that's everything from scheduling to billing to you know those kinds of things. What's, what's the juxtaposition there? Yeah, so it comes down to number of students and the tools you're using there. Um, what we notice is once a individual tutor either recruits two other tutors to join them or gets over six in students on their roster, for lack of a better term, that's when the administrative burden of using six to seven to eight different tools really starts to weigh on them. And that's when they really start to go and look at it. So what we've also learned is that once someone gets over 10 instructors, that's when different tools start to become meaningful for them, like payroll. You know, if you're teaching by yourself, you have payroll figured out. If you have <laughs> different instructors that need to get paid every two weeks, but have different price points for different sessions, like that's when you really look for a system that automates that payroll. Because if not, you could have someone just spending a full day running payroll for you every two weeks. So what I'll say is we have one group, um, tutoring company north of 15 million a year uh, in revenues. They have nearly a full-time team member who uh, is doing strictly manual tasks that a system like ours fully automates. Mm, okay, I understand. What's the difference in, or is that, what, what's the variability in pricing? If I'm a parent listening right now, or I'm a district, um, am I going to find a huge, wide variety in pricing, not only based on locality? And I guess what are the factors, right? So I'm thinking locality could be an issue. Subject matter could be an issue. Um, 
that, you know, the company I work with and the resources they're providing is like, what are, so I guess, what are the pricing variabilities and what are the factors that weigh into that? Yeah. So locality is the biggest one by far, which is one of the really interesting things that online tutoring has kind of shed a light on because a great example in a Richmond, Virginia, the average price of tutoring is around like $52 an hour. Um, if you're supporting private school families in New York City and you're charging less than $100 an hour, no one's going to work with you because they think you must be the worst tutor alive if you're only charging less than $100. So what I can say is that on our platform, taking out of account the uh, nonprofits who use it to facilitate their services and you know aren't charging anything for their tutoring services, we have a tutoring group that charges $10 an hour for subsidized tutoring, all the way up to a group that's charging $350 an hour for tutoring. Um, both one hour services, both being facilitated through the same platform. The difference is where they are working, number one, Two, who are they supporting? Is it private or public school students? And then three, who is the instructor on the other side of the uh, system or on the other side of the learning experience? So, you know, if you have an instructor who's done 5,000 hours of tutoring and has an Ivy League logo on their profile, that person's going to be charged significantly more than a student, than an instructor who might be a junior at a local state school looking to just make a little extra money on the side while they're uh, getting their degree. So I'd say it's location, the actual demographic they're serving, the instructor would be that third piece as well. Um, and I'd say that's really the core of uh, how tutoring companies price their services. What can, what can't you tutor? Like, are there subjects, are there subjects like we're over the last six months, were there subjects that just were kind of like, Hey, look, we're just gonna have to wait on that, you know? And I'm thinking something like, I can't really teach you how to throw a football online. You know, yeah. uh, so athletics, maybe, but, but then we have the arts, then we have, you know, are there certain pieces of science or, or those, like, are there subjects that are not applicable? Yeah. So if you distill the concept of tutoring to a monetary or resource exchange for knowledge, where you give someone something and they give you knowledge in a one-to-one -one or small group setting, um, there's really nothing you can't tutor. The question is how well can you teach it? And how, how effective can it be at the end of the day? Because a perfect example is um, with football, quarterbacks. You can be in a Zoom session, throwing a football, going through actual mechanics. The instructor on the other side could be giving you the best possible advice they can, but unless he can actually come over to you and like move your shoulder and be like, this is what it's supposed to feel like instead of that, you're not really gonna get that same value. So I think anything can be taught or tutored online. The most important thing is that expectations are set and technology is being developed in a purposeful way to improve that experience. And that's one of the reasons why we exist as Pearl today. There were great technologies out there that were purpose built for this tutoring relationship. So I believe in order to kind of cross that chasm from something you can do to something that's actually valuable, there needs to be purpose built technology for that. Mm. You've talked about, you know, $350 an hour for a tutor down to $10 an hour for a tutor. Um, I mentioned that, you know, uh, China just announced they're shutting down tutoring for English, at least, um, you know, uh, recently, uh, which is something that many, many families were doing over there, especially the, that, you know, massively growing, rapidly growing middle class in China that they're looking to sort of get into the global economy and whatnot. Talk to me about what you've seen in terms of tutoring being something that is continuing the economic and digital divide or the you know disparities that we see in society um maybe some of those are are we are we expecting too much of learners in terms of you know parents that say hey look you're, you're doing well in class but you're still going to get tutoring because we i mean we saw this in bangkok right where uh when my family lived there especially at, at sort of the middle school level where um, you know, kids were doing just fine. They were academically successful. They, you know, had a full, but then they would come home and they would still have two or three hours of tutors because their parents believed that they needed that extra piece. You see, like, so again, yeah. I'm a, a big universe of a question, but what has your experience shown in terms of economic divide, you know, opportunity, stress, anxiety levels, these kinds of things? Yeah, well, uh, your latter point there is completely accurate. If there's any way for parents to give their student an advantage and the parent has the resource to spend to get that advantage, 
they're going to do it. So in the town I grew up in, Scarsdale, New York, um, you know, I was getting tutored, but I was probably one of the few students who actually needed it. Uh, <laughs> but there to a couple of my buddies who like got a 32 on the ACT and their parents were like, well, that's not good enough. So we're going to push to get you a 35 or uh, you're getting an A minus. But in order to get into the AT class, you need to get an A. So we are going to pay for a $200 an hour tutor because we need you in this advanced taught or advanced place class in order to get into that college that we want you to go into. So unfortunately, that is never going to end. Where the way we approached it when we were a tutoring company is we actually got innovative on the way we structure our business model. So to give you an idea, we worked with some private schools. We would charge private schools a decent dollar range. Well, it also is like north of $90 an hour. And what we did there was we focused on supporting students who were on scholarship who couldn't pay for their own tutoring. So the private school would actually pull from their scholarship, pay for the students tutoring, and we would support it and then report back to the school on all the impact we made. So taking a third party uh, funded model to it. What we then also did though, was we worked with nonprofits and charged them at cost the same the price for the same service we were providing the private school. But because we were charging X to them and Y to them, we were able to create a business model that was still sustainable. So I think the tutor and companies themselves can, time, can take more innovative and more equitable approaches that make it easier or financially viable to deliver services to a student, no matter what their background is. Um, I think one of the big issues that was in the industry, which is now really been addressed over the last few months, but there will still always be a gap there is uh, infrastructure, where, you know, in order to get online tutoring, you don't just need a device, you need a device that's connected to a stable internet uh, connection. And then the third and probably the most underrated thing these past year was that you need a safe environment to learn. If you're in an environment where there's a ton of distractions going on, or you don't feel like you're safe and secure, and you're not actually focusing on what's being taught, you're not learning as well as that student who might be taking the, the same tutoring lesson in like an after school program where they have their own little cubby to learn in. So I think the government's done a lot to help beef up the infrastructure. A lot of uh, the private sector stepped in to give away devices and connectivity to students. I think there's still a gap there though, and there will always be until a student can get a not just stable and secure 5G connection to an online learning environment, but actually be able to be in an environment that's stable, secure, that they're gonna be able to fully pay attention to, um, I think is a piece of the pie that sometimes gets overlooked. Mm. Is there a time when parents should get out of the way and just sort of, you know, like you said, you know, if they have the means, they're gonna do this. Are, is is there an unrealistic expectation that's been built up in in, in the world or from your, from your vantage point or, is this just, you know, this is just the nature of the game? Yeah, well, from my vantage point, and I'd probably say from my parents' vantage point as well, you know, they were big believers in we got to set them free sometimes and let them fail and learn on his own. Because uh, that's really what puts students through adversity and what really makes them learn what they're capable of and what they can do on their own without necessarily having things handed to them. I think the unfortunate fact of the situation is that that will never be the case. And in order to... Um, implement something like that. I just think the logistics to it would be undoable, like being able to make parents promise that they didn't get an extra tutoring session for their son the night before the final because he has a 86 on his average going into that final test. Like, unfortunately, I just don't see a world where that would be the situation. I think what it needs to be is that some actual education to parents kind of letting them know like, hey, it's okay if your student doesn't get a 99 on every single test. And I think fundamentally, if the education system can change from a, what is the score you got on the last test to what's the potential of the student when put in the right learning environment, I think if we can find that shift in the industry, then it'll just naturally make people start to focus on how can I set my student to be up to be successful in the correct environment, as opposed to what can I give my student to get them to that 99 score, which then sets them into this next, uh, next thing I have in mind for them. Mm. Awesome perspective. Final question for you, John. Um, and I asked this of everybody on the podcast. Uh, what are you most excited about 
for the next six months, 12 months coming down the pipe that isn't isn't your platform, right? Could be another another shiny object that you know of, could be another company you're excited about, could be a, an innovation. Um, you know, what are you paying attention to integrating with, you know, something that you want to tell everybody about? Hey, check out this. Um, hmm. It's a great question. Um, and I have a couple different industries that I'm always just laser focused on, especially with things happening in college athletics right now with the NIL and students actually been able to get compensated for mm. their own. Name. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a big one. That's a big one. I'm a big fan of, um, had some experiences with college athletics and also a number of friends in that space. So that's something I'm looking at, but, um, in my opinion, the relationship between a student and instructor at the end of the day is the most important thing, whether it's a kindergartner, an executive, someone in college, because at the end of the day, we want to be with someone who we like to be around. I mean, companies do it all the time with the layover test. You have two equal candidates. One of them is a good time during a three hour layover. The other one isn't. You go with a person who's going to be entertaining for those three hours. That's the first time I've ever heard the layover test. I like oh, that one. Yeah, it's yeah, nice. Because- yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard it in other things, but nobody's ever called it the layover test before. I like that. Nice. Yeah, we might have dated ourselves a bit there with the layover because <laughs> who knows what travel looks like anymore. But um, I believe that companies, educators, organizations out there who are focused on creating the strongest or most effective relationship between a student and instructor are truly going to be the companies who end up making the biggest impact in education and are also going to be the companies who are going to help um, dissuade people from spending as much money as they can to get that 99 to focusing on who's the person who can truly unlock the most potential in my student. And uh, that is an area where we've seen a lot of platforms kind of enter the space to try to facilitate that relationship, really the communication between the parent, student, and instructor. Um, Remind is a company um, run by Brian out of San Francisco, outstanding communication platform that's really focused on keeping everyone informed so that they can really play their part. Mm. John, you're the CEO of a company that's now called Pearl, online tutoring platform for tutoring companies. I can't thank you enough for taking out the time to speak with me today. This has been super informative. Thank you so much. Hey, well, thank you for having us. Thanks again for tuning into today's episode of the e-learning podcast. If you like what you heard, please do me the favor of following us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or whichever social media you prefer. Also, if you're interested in diving deeper on e-learning, I encourage you to get your free ticket to the e-learning success summit, where there are more than 70 hours of presentations on best practices. Just go to elearningsuccesssummit.com. And then finally, for the latest news, information, and resources about e-learning, come subscribe to our newsletter at lmspulse.com. Thanks.